Good morning, good to see everybody. Today, you will be turning to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. As we made mention <clears throat> on Wednesday, maybe last Sunday as well, this will end uh, our study of Psalms uh, for now on uh, our Sunday morning lessons. We've sort of had a summer of Psalms. We studied seven. Today will be the eighth. There's about six more I want to do right now. The more I study, I'm sure there'll be more to do. But uh, we left off 142 of them. There's a lot in the Psalter. There's much good there. Much to learn about our Savior. Much to learn about uh, how the faithful can talk to God and the things of which uh, we can uh, approach him with in prayer. And we find in the Psalms often complaint, uh, but not complaint in the, uh, the type that God so vehemently despises and punished, like in the wilderness generation, they murmured in their tents. It doesn't seem at all that God is bothered when we, in prayer and faith, bring our problems to him. He tells us to do it with every anxiety we have. The thing he seems to especially mind is we can complain about him to others. You just think about our own life. Uh, somebody has a concern, a problem, they come to us and they can talk about it openly and frankly and we, we should uh, appreciate that, that they trust us that much, that they uh, would come to us and then we can, because they have come to us, we can deal with it. But when somebody complains about us, He's always talking about us to other people. That's a whole different thing. And that is what so much of the mumbling and grumbling <clears throat> that condemned Israel was. But today, in our psalm of study, Psalm 118, we're not going to have any of that. We're not going to have complaint. Even of the uh, part of this uh, psalm that goes through the biography uh, of the one who's writing, it's uh, uh, speaking of times of troubles that have passed, and things that, uh, uh, well, as we sing in the words of one of our hymns, he has brought us safe thus far. And so it's a glorious recall of the goodness of God when hard times came. And so today is just really a joyous and triumphant song. There, there is uh, joy radiating through every bit of it. And we're going to read it as we often do. I'll read the entirety of this psalm. It's just about as long as we would be able to do that. If it gets much longer, we wouldn't be able to. But uh, uh, <clears throat> we will read the entirety of the psalm. And if I am able to effectively read this publicly at all, I hope that you will see the joy flowing through all of it. Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What shall man do to me? The Lord is on my side as a helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in men. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I'll cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. But the name, in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of righteousness. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. 
Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter it. I thank you that you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God. I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. And so here we just see the joy. The joy in satisfaction in God. In a God who has delivered. In a God who has been good. In a God where certainly we can trust that he will be good. A God who has done so much. And then we'll also see, of course, that this is messianic that there are a number of places here where the speaker is christ and the application in the new testament is directly to him one of the things that's interesting about this psalm is just how often we find it used in the various settings where we find this placed we we find that this is one of the passover psalms Uh, The Jews had a group of psalms called the uh, Halal or the We Praise Psalms. In the Praise Psalms, it's also called, because of its close association with the Passover, they're also called the Egyptian Halal. So the Egyptian Praise section, because there's another Praise section, uh, another section of Hallelujah Psalms at the end of the book uh, of Psalms. So there's a a general Hallelujah, uh, which is uh, uh, around Psalm uh, 130 to the end of the book but there's uh, the Egyptian praise the the halal or Passover praise psalms and that's psalms 113 to 118 so this is the end <clears throat> of the praise psalms from uh, that were used at the Passover but we're not sure exactly how far back it was that the Jews began to sing these at the Passover it was probably in the intertestament period We know this is the psalms they sang in New Testament times at the Passover, and they still do to this day. These psalms are still sung at the Passover Seder in households who observe that. And so uh, this is is what uh, Jesus and the apostles would have sung when it says in Matthew 26 and verse 30, and in Mark 14 and 26, it says in most of our translations, and when they sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. It said they sung a hymn. That, I don't think the best translation, quite literally what it says there, is after they hymned. After they hymned. A hymn there is the verb, not the noun. Uh, they hymned. Now, we in English also use hymn as a verb. Uh, we have in one of our hymns, they hymned their king in strange divine, right? Uh, hymning is meaning to sing hymns. And in this case, the hymns we know they were singing were the Psalms. So this was sung by all the Jewish families at the Passover meal, including Jesus and the apostles. But uh, not just at the Passover, this was sung. Uh, This was sung uh, at the dedication of the temple. So the first record we have of this psalm, because we're not sure when the psalms were edited and compiled into the, 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 the five books, the 150 psalms we have now. But the, the first time in history we find it is in the book of Second Chronicles. In the Second Chronicles, when they were uh, dedicating uh, the temple, when they were bringing the Ark in, of the Covenant into the temple, it says this, Second Chronicles 5 in verse 2, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's house, to bring the Ark of the Covenant out of the city of David, which is in Zion, and they brought it into the tent of meeting, and the holy vessels were in the tent, and the priest brought them, verse 5. The priest then came out of the holy place after depositing the Ark, 
And then in, in 2 Chronicles 5 and 12, it lists the Levitical singers, Asaph and Heman, we know from the Psalms, and several others uh, who were reigned in fine linen uh, with cymbals and harps and lyres. And they stood east of the altar with 120 priests who were trumpeters. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and the singers to make themselves heard in unison, in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised, the trumpeters and cymbals and the other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, here's what they sang. For he is good, and his loving kindness endures forever. That's verse 1 uh, of this psalm, and also verse 29. And so they sang the psalm, which in song, which is this song at the beginning and the end. So it mentions basically the title of this psalm. This would be a song they sung in the temple, the, the professionals, the trained Levites, the priests, the singers, the musicians. In the history of the temple, we know that things didn't go so well over the centuries. The temple was mistreated. The temple uh, fell into uh, disrepair. Uh, Josiah had to repair it. Uh, we know that eventually, because of the idolatry that they even brought into the very temple itself, uh, God had his temple closed. He had the temple destroyed by the Babylonians. He had the people sent to Babylon in captivity. On the cusp of sending them to Babylon in captivity, Jeremiah makes mention of this psalm. This same psalm. In Jeremiah 33, Jeremiah prophesies what will happen. Jeremiah 33, we won't read all of it, but an abridgment. Jeremiah 33, 4. They are coming in to fight against the Chaldeans to fill up this, uh, play, this, this house and this place with dead bodies of men who I will strike in my anger and my wrath for I've hidden my face from them because of their evil. All right, I'm going to bring them in here. We're bringing people from the outlying towns around. We're going to bring them all to Jerusalem and to this place, and we're going to have a killing. And it won't be the invaders. It'll be my people. I will cleanse from them the guilt of the sin that is, that is against me. And then, after that, I will forgive the guilt of their rebellion. So, after we have this punishment, God says, I have something, again, better in store for this place. Verse 9, In this city there shall be to me, again, a name of joy, of praise, and of glory for all the nations of the earth who shall hear it, will, and all the good that I've done for them, they will fe have fear and trembling because of the good and the prosperity I provide. Thus says the Lord, in this place, this place where there was going to be murder and death and violence and destruction, in this place of which you say it is a waste without man or beast, in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man or inhabitant or beast, there shall again be heard the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who sing as they give thanks, offerings in the house of God. And here's the text. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says the Lord. And so when God says, I'm going to, I'm going to destroy this place, there's no doubt. Right, that's Jeremiah. That's why he's the weeping prophet. But have no fear, have no doubt that in the future, I'm going to restore it. And what will they sing? Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That is verse 1 of this psalm. Now, if we think about modern songs, we sometimes have the title of a song, right? We sometimes have the title of a song, and then we also have the words of the song itself. If you look, in our, even in our hymnal, up until about 1890, every title of every hymn in our hymn book is the same as the opening words. Because songs didn't have separate titles from their text. They, we didn't start putting separate titles on things until very recently. And so how is a song named? A song is named for its opening lines. And that is the same thing that happens here. They don't say they're going to sing Psalm 118. But it quotes the first verse of Psalm 118 because that's the title or that's what stands for the psalm. And so in the prophecy, this psalm is mentioned in a prophecy of the good that will come. 
So when good comes and good is returned to Israel, they will sing this song again. That's what Jeremiah is saying. So this is the psalm that stands for the goodness of God. This is the psalm that stands for the blessing of God over his people. He says, we're going to destroy this place, there's no doubt. But in the future, it's going to come back and here's what they'll sing. Well, in the book of Ezra, we find the rebuilding. In the book of Ezra, we find that famous day in which there were shouts of joy for the laying of the foundation of the temple, but also there, were, there was weeping and sadness over what was lost, right? And notice what song is there that's at the center of that. Ezra 3, verse 10. As the builders laid the foundation, so now we are 100 years in the future, Temple's been gone for 70 years, and then it took them a while to get the thing started back up again amongst the returnees. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the direction of David, king of Israel. They're recreating what Solomon did at David's instruction. They're doing that again now with the new temple, the second temple. And they sang responsively. So they called a line. They responded with a line. A line was called. A a line was answered. They sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. What did they sing? For he is good and his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout. And they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house was laid. Now here's the part we all remember. Many of the priests and Levites of the head of the father's house, the old men who'd seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of the house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy. So the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. And so they sang this song when they dedicated the temple. Jeremiah said... It's all going to be cut off. But again, you'll sing this song. And in Ezra 3, what are they doing? As the new house is being built, they're singing this song. And one more time in Scripture, where we find the people singing this song. And that is at the triumphal entry. This is the song the people sang as Jesus went to Jerusalem. As they sung with great gusto. Like those people there, there was a great shout of joy at the rebuilding. But it was also mingled with silence or sadness. On this day of the triumphal entry, there won't be any mingling with with sadness, although there will be a few people not happy. But at the triumphal entry, as Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives, as he rode along, Luke 19, 36, as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, so down the Mount of Olives, through the brick of Kidron, and up the, the, uh, the hill to the gates, Uh, that would lead into Jerusalem and into the temple, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. And they were saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The other quotes we saw from Chronicles and Jeremiah and Ezra, it was quotes from the beginning of the psalm. This is a quote from the end of the psalm. So when you have a whole group of people, uh, of course people who were used to singing this song, they sang it at the Passover, they sang it on their pilgrim journey to and from Jerusalem. As they went to the Passover, they're singing the lyrics of this song. Well, How does that happen? Well, they're singing the song, right? They're singing the whole song. We only have a piece of it here uh, to to tell us what it was they were singing, but it quotes the most relevant passage, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And who was it that was coming in the name of the Lord? Well, it was Jesus, right? And so this is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, this is Jesus. This is the stone the builders rejected. The Christians uh, will tell us, the apostles will reveal that. So this is the song they sang at triumphal entry. So let's examine for what time we have left this great psalm, this multi-use psalm. We start with a call and response. 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Again, that's this part that's used to identify this psalm and those passages of the Old Testament. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say this. Let the house of Aaron say this. Let everybody who fears the Lord. Let us all magnify him. And here's one of those great things where you have at the triumphal entry a valley full of people who know the words. Or in the temple you have throngs of people who know the words. It's almost as if uh, you picture here the events of the Bible as a musical. <laughs> so we think about these great you know, musicals that Hollywood produces for us. And you go, how does everybody know the words of these songs, right? And they're, they're all singing along. Well, in this case, they all know the words of this song. Why? Because it's the worship songs. It's the song of the Passover. It's the song they've been singing all their life, right? It's sort of like uh, today, every now and again, you, know, you see on social media where uh, some group of people, uh, usually some Christian group of some kind, they're in a restaurant or they're in a plane or they're in a mall or they're in a, uh, I've seen some where it's in hotels, uh, where there's a whole group of people who come together, but they all know the same songs. And so what happens when one of them starts to sing it? Everybody can sing. What are they doing here at the triumphal entry? They're doing what this song says. Let's all sing together. So this song of the worship of the temple spread, and this song was sung to magnify God on many occasions. But we start with the great call and response. Then we have the celebration through dangers. As uh, Amazing Grace would summarize this whole concept through many dangers, uh, uh, toils, and snares, I have already come, was grace that brought me safe thus far. Well, here is the psalm version of that, listing out the dangers and the toils and the troubles. I called out of distress to the Lord. He answered me. The Lord's on my side. I'll not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is my helper. Well, it's those words just slightly rearranged because two lines are flipped in order. But those words are from Hebrews 13, 6. And so for Christians... Why do we? Why can our character be free of the love of money? Go well, because God's my helper. What will man do to me? I don't need to be afraid. One of the reasons why people are greedy is they think that in money is security. Well, I've got a better security. My security is the Lord's. I don't have to be afraid. What can man do to me? Or as the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans seems to allude to this passage when he says, what shall we say? If God's for us, who will be against us? Right? That's, that's the thought of this, this verse. Verse 6, so the Lord is my helper. I will look on and triumph when people hate me. It's better to take refuge in him than to trust in man. Better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Hey, y'all, how y'all liking our political leadership? Anybody ready to trust their life and their savings and their security to our current, polit current political leadership? Well, how about the last one? I don't know. But don't worry, the next one, the next one will be good. We can trust them, whoever it will be. Or you think maybe we should trust in the Lord. No, we trust in the Lord more than man, more than princes. In the name of the Lord, I cut off, verse 10, the nations that surrounded me. They are on every side. They surrounded me like bees. They were just swarming around. But in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed. I was falling. But the Lord helped me. So he is my strength and my song. There's the thing. It's not that we don't have trouble. But we recognize who helped us get through the trouble. We had the trouble, but we celebrate and sing to the Lord because He's our strength, our song, our salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. Sometimes people wonder about assurance. Am I really saved or am I not? Well, you know, let me ask you. Let me ask you about the glad songs of salvation you sing. Oh, you don't sing the glad songs of salvation? Why not? Learn some. Uh, look around. The book of Psalms is full of them. Learn some of those. Yeah, you'll feel a lot better about things, I am sure, and feel much more assured because the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. We almost break into call and response sections over and over through this. This biography of dangers, but really it's a biography of trust and of celebration. I won't live, or not, I won't die, but I'll live. I'll recount his deeds. Yeah, he disciplined me severely, verse 18, but not to death, so that I may be victorious and I may follow him and find good things. So he now says, and I think at this point, we really do picture the messianic part. 
where the author here of the psalm says, let me into God's house. I've been delivered. I'm going down to the temple. Let me in. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter in through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter in. Well, I'm coming because I'm righteous. I'm going where the righteous go. I thank you that you have answered me and you have become my salvation. So open up these gates. Open up the gates of the Lord's house and let me in. I am coming to give thanks and praise. And I really think it's this sort of thing. It's not just that in Psalm uh, 118, we have the blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord at the triumphal entry. But as we have all of this, we have this whole psalm. Jesus is walking down uh, the, the valley, uh, uh, in the valley up from the side of the Mount of Olives. He's crossing the brook of Kidron. He's walking right up into Jerusalem. And what are his people singing? Open the gates of righteousness. Open the gates of the house of the Lord that we can come in. They're bringing Jesus in as the Messiah. And I really think it's, that's what unnerves the Pharisees, the scribes. And they go, tell your disciples to knock this off. No, we're not knocking this off. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad. This is what this was about. For the Messiah to come into the temple of God. That stone the builders rejected. That stone the builders rejected has become the very cornerstone. Verse 22. That's quoted for us repeatedly in the New Testament. That's Matthew 21. Jesus himself says, have you not heard the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people producing its fruits. And the one on whom the stone falls will be broken to pieces as when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus said, you need to recognize, this was about me. I'm here. I'm that one. And the apostles apply this to Jesus. Acts 4, 11. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you, the builders, which has become the very cornerstone. This is what Peter said. He said, so the honor is for you who believe. But for those who don't believe, the stone the builders rejected became the cornerstone. And this is what Paul was referring to in Ephesians. That the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ himself being the cornerstone. Right? They rejected it. He's still the cornerstone. They didn't like it. They, got, you know, they didn't get to pick another rock. They just had the big rock land on them. And they were crushed to pieces. And so, let me into the Lord's house. I know you're rejecting me, but what you are rejecting, the Lord is making the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, verse 23. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I know a great number of inspirational ca uh, calendars, and like they'll have this verse all over it, right? This is the day the Lord has made. This is a good verse for every morning, because every morning is the day the Lord has made. But the day the Lord made, in this case, it's actually referring specifically to this day of Jesus being made and shown to be his Messiah. Let's rejoice in that. That is marvelous in our eyes. So we pray, O oh Lord, give success. We pray, give us success. So let this happen. Basically, let the Lord's will be done. And let's recognize this is of God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This verse is also quoted numerous times through the New Testament. As we said, this is quoted in Matthew at the uh, triumphal entry. It's also in Luke. It's also in Mark. It's also in John. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record these words as the words of the triumphal entry. This is the one who has been made the king by God. In John's gospel, it says this, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So John adds to us uh, a bit there of uh, that they were recognizing at the triumphal entry and singing that the king of Israel has come. John the Baptist had sent uh, people to Jesus some years earlier they ask, are you the one that is to come? Or should we ask for another? Well, Jesus said, tell him, I tell him that the, the blind have their sight and the lame are walking and the lepers are healed. So yeah, I'm the one. But now here at the triumphal entry, what does the whole nation know? He is the one, right? He is the one. So 
the final praise. The Lord is God. And he made his light to shine on us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords upon the horns of the altar. So for those of Israel, this is great. Let's go to God's house and let's take our sacrifice with us. And then we're going to tie up our sacrifice right there to the altar so it can be offered. Of course, we in Christ, and thinking about this in a messianic way, uh, we think about the bittersweetness of this. The sacrifice was bound. The sacrifice was offered. And it saved us all. That awful cost, but it saved us all. So verse 28, you are my God. I will give you thanks. You are my God. I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. And so, imagine the Jews, over the many years, singing this at the Passover in hope. right? Singing it in exile, thinking we're going to get to go back. And then they got to go back, and they got to sing this song in a new temple. And then the scattered Jews in the second temple time, uh, they sang this song at the Passover, thinking about what a great thing it would be to be in Jerusalem again and have the sacrifice or have the, the, the feast there. But then that temple went away in Christ. And those who believed in Christ, they could see this is the fulfillment. This is what it was about. It was all about Christ and leading to Christ. And ironically today, at the Passover, the Jews still sing this but not recognizing that it's come, not recognizing it's been fulfilled. And they're pleading for a thing that's already been accomplished, and it's marvelous in our eyes, but for many they're blinded to it. And so there's a a, a hollowness there in it, because they've been waiting for so long, thinking of some fulfillment to come, when the fulfillment is already here. And others, those wild olives, as it were, grafted in, if you think about Romans 11, those wild olives grafted in and they've been celebrating it this whole time. And so, sing me a song of triumphant joy. The song they sang in the temple, the song they sang at the Passover, the song they sang at the triumphal entry, the song that we can sing daily, celebrating in Christ and the good things that God has done for us. All right, with that then, we'll close. Having concluded our study of this psalm and for now, a systematic study of Psalms. Uh, if you need today to come to Jesus, the one who is, the one whose doing was marvelous in the eyes of God, the one who came to be that sacrifice, bound to the altar as it were, and given for man. If you need to come to him and confess him, or if you need to confess sin to return, we offer the invitations we stand.